you know, they are fighting on the side of a more irregular fire, not in volleys, but, uh, you know, they might be kind of harassing the enemy on the flanks and so forth. And all these tactics, of which, you know, there are dozens of different maneuvers that a company might be capable of, uh, that is far and away more complicated than what you might see in the movies. It's just two lines bashing away at each other. Yes. I mean, yeah, you might, you might fire kind of a, uh, uh, you know, a, a gauging shot at 150 yards, but uh, uh, you're, you're not going to spend, uh, you know, too much time, uh, you know, wasting powder. Battle of Brandywine is uh, like a, an engagement that took all day. Uh, the light infantry of the uh, British book guards, they only fired 11 rounds that entire day, and uh, on average. And uh, it's, it's like the one company where you know exactly how many on average they fired. And uh, and this was a unit that was harassing, you know, the American uh, retreat through that battle for hours and hours on end. Uh, oftentimes, you were fighting with the bayonet. Uh, you know, it. Uh, you know, there's this. What's that? That's pretty close. It is. It is. I mean, there's this uh, uh, expression of zeal and bayonet owner. You know, that was the preference sometimes, uh, is uh, to be able to uh, get close enough where you could fire a devastating volley, and then you go after them and run them down with a bayonet, right? Because that's, that can be more effective if you have a unit that is confident in its abilities, uh, its discipline, uh, morale and so forth, it's where these sorts of, uh, you know, the esprit de corps, the uh, uh, sort of pride that a unit takes in itself, that's where these things become important as well. Any other quick questions? Shit. Yes. How many people in a unit typically? Uh, I mean, well, yeah. it, it varies. Mm -hmm. You have uh, a company size unit might be between 50 and 100 men, it depends because of attrition, uh, and it depends on the unit. But. Uh, by and large, uh, those uh, companies are subdivided into platoons, usually two platoons uh, per, uh, per 50-man company or so. And uh, a regiment might have 10 companies. Uh, at full strength, you might have 500 men, but usually they hover around 250 to 350 after these regiments have uh, seen a great deal of campaigning. And one company might be back home in, in Britain uh, recruiting, and uh, you know the, the Americans as well. They have a very hard time uh, maintaining their numbers. Other questions? Yes. Okay, we just saw the parade, and we just saw the movie. And what was your question after the movie? She said, "Why were the British in the parade?" <laughs> well. I suppose because uh, this is surrender day, so they were they were probably marching to their surrender. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's why. But uh, you know, it, it is important to remember that before the Declaration of Independence in 1776, everyone thought of themselves as British subjects, right? 1775, early 1776. This is a year, year and a half into the war, and so far it's a resistance movement to the parliamentary policy and not against the king, right? They considered themselves loyal British subjects, but they thought that Parliament had overstepped its bounds and that they still <laughs> wanted uh, to be part of the British Empire. They were still proud to be part of the British Empire. Is that your question? Um, and uh, so it's, it, it's one of those things to keep in mind that a lot of things changed in 1776. All right, I'm going to fire off uh, another volley, this time a little bit quicker. And uh, then we'll get to more fighting. Okay. Right. So again, the command is when you use this little uh, device called a hammer saw, just a safety measure to make sure that musket doesn't drop. <laughs> so it'll be high man load. Okay, again, opening the pan. Putting a few grains of powder. Charging the cartridge, drawing the rammer, ramming down the cartridge, and returning. Fairly quick. And it's make ready. Take aim. Fire. Oh, well, there you go, folks. That hammer's solved. 
And it's a lot louder when you have a, a live uh, musket ball ground in there. So it has more of a percussive effect. Um, and you will feel it up against your shoulder. But uh, yeah, when you have an entire unit, you know, firing off a volley can get very loud. And uh, you know, a gentleman I was speaking with earlier today said he was at a reenactment where they actually had uh, numbers in the thousands attending. And that with the volleys from the different regiments, it actually have it ringing in his ears. Now, at the discharge of muskets, you also have a great deal of smoke. This is what we call the fog of war in parts. Sometimes it can be literal as well as figurative. You know, the warfare is very confusing. You have those musket balls firing through the air, whistling past your ears, striking the ground around you, striking bodies, breaking through bones, smashing through kitten canteens and so forth. You know, the sound of men shouting, drums, fights, muskets, cannons, sound of men dying, sound of horses dying. I mean, this is chaotic in every respect. And what your job is as soldiers is to march through that hail of lead, to march through the smoke from the discharge of the muskets and drive the enemy off the battlefield with a bayonet. That is how this war would be won. It's not an easy thing. But the army that came out of Valley Forge in 1778 could prove that they had reached the level of Europeans in terms of their ability to stand their ground and hold uh, their place in line. All right, so that concludes the main part of uh, the musket demonstration. Uh, I can stay here and answer questions uh, for as long as you like. Um, and uh, I can pretty much talk all day. So, uh, <laughs> Afterwards, I will be uh, out front.